Once again, hello, Rabbi. Hello, Joe. Good to see you and good to be with you again. I'd like to continue our discussion about uh, the Sermon on the Mount. There's a lot of material here, including some things that might surprise people that are common elements of both Judaism and Christianity. One of my goals is to show that we have common goals, common beliefs, and yet we have different rituals, different practices, and different philosophies, and that's all fine because we're not at odds with each other. It's not that one is better, one's worse, just different. Let's start with one of the more famous quotations from the Sermon on the Mount, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. Can you talk a little bit about that in terms of Judaism versus Christianity? Yeah, let's pull out the word versus, and because that would imply that there's one against or opposed, just sometimes different views of the same thing, sometimes common views, doesn't, doesn't matter, but we don't want to put one as opposed to the other. It might have been Gandhi who said, if we follow an eye for an eye and tooth for a tooth, we will have a country, a universe, a planet of toothless blind people. And I think that's a good observation. And it's consistent with the rabbinic teaching in the Talmud that Jesus was aware of because he was aware of Jewish teachings. He was trained in Judaism. He knew about Talmud, Midrash, and Mishnah. The rabbis realized what Gandhi would say. You can't go around poking out eyes and taking out teeth. We need another way of restitution. If someone does something to you, why don't we attach a monetary value? How much you lost by that damage, future, future losses from the damage, and we'll come up with a monetary compensation so that if my cow, my car, anything I own does something to somebody else, I'm responsible for damages, present and future loss of income. So does that refer to the other less known part of that quote about if anyone wants to take your coat, give your cloak as well? The wording that I see in the Bible is if anyone wants to sue you and take your coat. And I think this, this just shows a difference in interpretation of this idea. We're trying to get away from an eye for an eye. We're trying to get away from that direct doing and come up, the Talmud comes up with monetary compensation. Jesus adds a different element to it and says, here's someone in need. Someone may need more than just your shirt and someone may need company for more than one mile. So he's adding another way to get away from doing things literally. And that's the goal here. Neither one is better nor worse. And we may want to combine them and say there are times when someone needs something, you give them more than they're asking for. There may be times when we do monetary compensation. So perfect example, two different responses to the same goal, getting away from something that's literal. So and let's skip ahead a little bit here because I'm not going to do them in order. But when you talk about giving to the needy, and uh, in Judaism, it's called tzedakah, or is mitzvah the more appropriate? No, no, it's tzedakah, coming from the word, from the prophets. Tzedek, tzedek, tirdof, let righteousness come down like a river. You want to do the right thing. And so Jesus addre is addressing, what does it mean to, to give to the needy? Well, you want to do the right thing. You don't announce it with trumpets. You don't brag about what you do. You want to do the right thing. And you want to do it quietly and in secret. And that's very much tzedakah. You don't want to embarrass the person by making them beg for it. You don't want to embarrass them by making them think that they're unworthy and you're going to give to someone unworthy. No, no, no. You, you do it quietly, anonymously, if you can. You create jobs for people without going out and saying to them, you poor slob, I'm going to be very nice to you and give you a job. Come. So very much this idea of the prophets doing the right thing. 
doing it quietly without a lot of publicity, no trumpets. Well, so that to back up again and, and jump back and forth and let me know if I'm doing it too much. So how would that relate to loving your enemies? Another often quoted principle of the Sermon on the Mount. Uh, love your enemy as your love your enemy as yourself, or forgive your neighbor as yourself. Yeah, very often we hear the expression "walk in my shoes." Often the problem is I take you as the enemy; you're against me. And both Judaism and Christianity ask us to stop for a moment and put ourselves in the other person's position. Where are they coming from? Why are they saying this? And truly, are they an enemy of mine or are they just presenting an alternative position, alternative choice, something different? I think we want to back up to what I said earlier is what is go actually going on? So when I label someone as my enemy, it may be as simple as they disagree with me. Well, we can disagree with each other. So let's stop for a moment and put ourselves in those, their position. In Hasidic Judaism, the Baal Shem Tov taught, we should dance in a circle. And as we move around the circle, each of us is in the place of our neighbor, in the place of the other. And if I put myself in your place, I'll be less apt to judge or criticize you because I now understand why you're saying it. We don't have to agree to everything. We don't have to, that's not, the, that's not what we're saying. What we're, what we're saying is let's understand another opinion. Let's understand what the other is saying and let's reach a resolution. Now, on that note, one of uh, the first dramatic experiences I ever had in temple concerning prayer that came from the Sermon on the Mount. And all of a sudden, familiar words started being said in the congregation. And uh, you know them very well, of course, as uh, our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Uh, and it was the Lord's Prayer, or uh, as I, as we refer to it in parochial school, the Our Father. But can you talk about that common prayer and, and prayer in general? Certainly, certainly. I think this is very germane to all faiths. Do not stand on a street corner. Don't shout your prayer. Don't stand outside the metro and hand out pamphlets with prayer or tell people that what they're doing isn't right. And do not babble like the pagans. Do not use many words. And I think this is really a statement for all of us is that our goal is not to be better or not to show people that they're wrong and I'm right, but we want to pray privately, quietly, and we want to have public worship, but that's because we all, we all agree. So whether we're listening to the mass or praying the Sabbath worship service, morning, afternoon, evening, whatever we may be doing, we're with a community of people who believe like we do, and it's appropriate to be in the community, but we're not on a street corner. We're not handing it out. We're not showing people we're better because we do this or do that. No, we do it quietly. And the Our Father, the prayer, I mean, the, the disciples gathered and said to Jesus, Master, how shall we pray? And again, having been brought up in a Jewish environment, having been taught by the rabbis, he decided to use a format that was very familiar. It's the Kaddish de Rabbanan, the sanctification prayer for our teachers. And it's a paradigm, it's a format. And he just plugged in some different words and you picked up on it right away during the high holy days because it's what we're praying for the high holy days. We don't want the mistake of thinking that the translation is what it's about because we can translate things with slightly different form, more familiar, and we might think this is something very different. But if we use the same kind of translation, it's the Kaddish to Rabbanan format. It's a high holiday prayer. And it's 
nothing outside of the tradition and nothing contraindicated in Judaism. And that goes back to my theme, that there are as many ways to reach God as there are leaves on the trees in the forest. Can that be used as a litmus test for true versus false preaching? Uh, as I say, as you like to say, true prophets versus false prophets. Yes, I, that, you, I think you've hit upon something because we're all warned. Be careful of false prophets that come in sheep's clothing, but they're really wolves. And the prophets constantly point out, Moses warned us against false prophets. And the, the litmus test is really very, very simple. A false prophet is out for themselves. They're out to buy a bigger airplane, a bigger house, self-aggrandizement. They're out for power and control. They're out to get elected to political office. And there's your litmus test. What have I said to you that will lead to me making more money, me becoming, a f me becoming famous and being able to have power, me getting elected? No, I'm just reflecting on our different religious teachings. And that's our litmus test. And that also applies to the, the disciples as well. What's in it for people? Remember, grandma always told you, Joe, if it's too good to be true, it's not true. Well, you're not too good to be true, Rabbi. I appreciate on especially this joint holiday of Easter and Passover, some of the comparisons and observations that you've given us today. And thank you for providing this opportunity for me to talk about Judaism Christianity, and a number of other topics.